Our next storyteller is Russell Sherman. And uh, please come on up and tell your story, Russell. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, this story took place in 1972. It is a true story. Um, I got out of school in 71 and came up this way for a summer job, owing student loans and, and everything. Uh, another buddy of mine uh, graduated with me, went fishing. And we ended up in the fall of 1972 in our first offshore site, which was offshore lobstering. At the time, the offshore lobster trap industry was just beginning and it was prosecuted out on the canyons. <clears throat> Pardon me, we were a couple of green kids, here down to here. My buddy Glenn had a big red beard, and uh, we fell in with a bunch of maniacs. And uh, all we had to recommend ourselves was reasonable intelligence and a willing to work. Both of us had been brought up in rather plebeian families and worked hard. Uh, so we, we spent our first season learning. At the end of the first season, our captain, who was a fellow from Maine, we nicknamed him uh, Captain Smoke Tread Lightning because he was, he was a driven man, um, uh, a workaholic, and he had been a small boat fisherman in Maine for many years, uh, quite a reputation up that way. Well, the poor guy, I won't say the poor guy, how should I say that? He, uh, he drove himself to a nervous breakdown one, one trip. Uh, when we refused to go on deck, because my, my buddy, Glenn, actually had the oil jacket sleeve torn off of his arm and would have gone with it if, if the wire hadn't just slipped his hand. And so uh, the cook, who is my hero, I'm here because of him today, uh, a fellow named Robert Damon. He used to say, uh, Mrs. Damon's little boy, Robert, <laughs> was how he, he introduced ourselves to us. Uh, flat top brush cut, beard, didn't have much use for long haired boys. Um, but he appreciated work and respect and we respected him. We did exactly what he said. Uh, he spoke up that morning when the skipper said, boys, I hate laying two. Do you want to go to work? And he said, David, if someone goes out there, if we go back on that deck this morning, we're going to lose somebody and I won't stand for it. The engineer, Steve, I'll leave his name at Steve, was a Greek fellow, handsome, six foot two, 190 pounds, the epitome of a Greek sailor. And he had been a missile man on the Nautilus and was quite proud of it and we were quite impressed. Uh, always wore a Greek captain's cap, trim beard, well dressed, didn't, didn't talk much, but a good shipmate, a really great shipmate. Well, when we were all fired, he drove the boat home in a gale of Norwest wind. We come 24 hours from Lydonia Canyon, bucking into it. He tied the throttle down and he stuck his knife in the dashboard next to it and said, don't let any of you son of a bitches cut that string. And we didn't. <laughs> so we all, when we got to the dock, we were all packing our gear. The captain jumped ashore. The owners of the boat, which was uh, the Usen brothers, came back and they said, where are you going, boys? So we said, well, we're packing our clothes. We've been fired, we've been put ashore. And he said, uh, David's had a problem and we're taking care of that. Why don't you all stay? And so what happened was, of course, they were anxious to get the boat back out because we'd gone all the way to the canyons, started to haul gear. We had one string aboard. Of course, it was a catastrophe. We came back home again and being a company boat, they were worried about money. <laughs> so they promoted Stevie to captain, which he was more than qualified for. Bob Damon, who Bob was an old man to me. I was 24. He was 48 or 49, old enough to be my father. He remained as the mate and the cook. And Glenn and I, Glenn was re uh, promoted to engineer. And we reported right back to Boston the next day, ready to go fishing. Uh, the replacement came aboard, a little short Newfoundlander, about that tall, three fingers missing on his left hand, <laughs> and quite a cocky little guy. <laughs> and in putting his bag and everything into the bunk, took a 32 gun out of his pocket and made everybody see it, tucked it under his pillow, you know. <laughs> and uh, 
We, we were uh, impressed, <laughs> both, both being just kids ourselves, you know. And, uh, and he sat down and proceeded to tell us the story about how he had uh, been drinking one night down at the State Fish Pier in, uh, in Boston and uh, had run out of smokes. No place open, so he broke into the No Name Restaurant, famous restaurant down there, smashed in the cigarette machine, got his two decks of camels, and walked out into the cold to be confronted by a state officer. <laughs> of course, the state troopers run that place. And he was so brilliant that he ran off and, and tried to make an escape, jumped into the water, and they had to save him. <laughs> so anyway, the scene is set, and we're, we're steaming back out into the grounds. Well, it was gale warnings had been put up before we left the dock. And Stevie really didn't want to go, but you know, they were pushing us. And so we started out. And as we proceeded, it was a long steam, uh, storm warnings were posted. And we were down in the forecastle talking, of course, and, and um, it was a bad custom, but we never had problems with it before. We always had a few cases of beer on the boat, uh, Schlitz as it would be. <laughs> And the Newfoundlander made this discovery and was all giggles and started lugging beer up to the skipper. Well, we didn't realize it. Stevie was a fine gentleman and everything and a smart guy, but he had an alcohol problem that none of us knew about because, of course, we didn't socialize ashore. And so the day went by and the fleet had turned around and was heading for Nantucket because of storm warnings had been posted. Steve called the company and said that he wanted to turn the boat around and go for Nantucket as well. The company said, don't bring that boat to the dock. And in those days, it was WOU, was the telephone communication. You call the uh, shore side operator, ship to shore operator, over your two-way radio. They connected you and, and you talked over and out, back and forth on a telephone conversation. But the whole ocean could hear you. All the fellows were tuned into WOU. But believe me, we heard some, some great conversations in the evening sometimes as young fellows listening to the guys uh, pining away for their wives. But um, an argument ensued, of course. Some of the other skippers came in and said, let them come out here and, and let her lay, you know. Let them take the beating, you know. They're sitting in an office and all this stuff. And so, of course, the, the beers were going down. We weren't drinking. We were down to reading. I, I love to read as well. Uh, bring a book with me wherever I go. Um, and it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. The boys up above, the Newfoundlander and the skipper, were not eating at all, which should have clued me in, but I was green in those days and didn't realize uh, what the demon run could do to people, although I'd had a few experiences myself. Um, just had a beautiful dinner. I remember it was a boiled dinner. Bob was a great cook, a great Yankee cook. And we're all sitting around the table. Now, actually, I was in the bunk and Glenn was in the bunk. Bob was at the edge of the table. We were having our after dinner smoke. And the boat slid, caught and slid. Now, that's a funny, funny thing, you know, because you're not, the boat's not supposed to stop. <laughs> and it did. And we were, we didn't know. Bob turned white. He was a big man, 5'11", 220, and she let go. And she slid again, and she let go, and she slid the third time, and she stopped. And Bob started to get up, and we said, Bob, what, what's going on? He said, I think we're aground. And sure enough, we were. What had happened was is they, we were coming up to Nantucket on the eastern side, and he went up one buoy shy and headed her to the westward. And he went right up on a sandbar that was about 600 yards to the south of the Rosen Crown Shoal, where some years before a fishing boat had lost all hands in that area, precisely the same problem. It was just before dark, and the easterly wind was bre breezing up pretty heavy. Uh, the boat started lifting and pounding. Of course, we were right, Bob started up the stairs. We were way down on the forecastle, came to the mid deck, and then up to the higher deck with the captain and the and the Newfoundlander were. We came right up the stairs behind him, Glenn and I, uh, a couple of boys thinking that perhaps we'd <laughs> chosen the wrong occupation. <laughs> uh, she was pounding quite hard. It was hard to get up. You know, there was a lot of... The scene that, that greeted us when we got up in the pilot house was everything around us was turquoise blue. 
we were on Sand Shoal, and it was blowing about 20, 25 easterly now, starting to pick up, and everything was turquoise blue, and the waves started to break over her on the side. The wheel was spinning, it was a destroyer wheel, no, no spokes onto her, outside spokes. The wheel was spinning, and it was a hydraulic rig. We had a little pin here with a little rubber Mexican guy on the pin. When you pull the pin up, it stopped the wheel dead. Well, the skipper, who was in his cups, well into his cups, was trying to stop the wheel because actually the only thing that was exposed was the rudder and the wheel. We were that far into the sandbar. And forget, we'd gone over two sandbars to get to the third. Uh, Stevie was quite comical in doing it. Bob was not impressed. Now, Bob had been fishing all his life. He was a guy in his late 40s. Uh, went over, turned him around with his left hand and gave him the sweetest right hook I've ever seen and collapsed him right on the spot. He collapsed, he just, boom. The skipper was down and out. The Newfoundland, Newfoundlander, the great boy with the 32 pistol, was in the corner, tears in his eyes, praying, Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with us. And Bob looked around, he told Ingvi right away, very calm, very collected, go down to the engine room. The engine room was aft. Make sure the water's all right. Make sure she's not leaking. Give me a report. Sherman, I want you to go down to the fish hole. Do the same. Get going now. Come on, boys, let's go. Uh, we obeyed immediately, as we were green college boys, that's all we were, and from Connecticut besides. <laughs> uh, the uh, farm boys, um, Bob immediately got on the radio, mayday to, to the Coast Guard in Nantucket. We had the old Loran A's in those days, and it was, it was quite a, an ordeal, it was quite a, a sequence of events to, to get your positioning in on there. He did that, found out where he was. Um, now it became dark. As I said, she was always lifting herself and pounding. I didn't know how much longer she would take, how much longer she could stand it, and neither did Bob. There was a Portuguese boat behind us, uh, an old Eastern rig dragger that had come up, and of course he had witnessed this, and he was on the radio as well. Uh, he called us, and he said, Captain, he said, I can't come in to get you. He said, there's no way out of there except the way you came, and I can't risk my vessel and my crew to help you out. But if somehow, on God's good earth, if you can turn that boat around, I will stand on station, and you come for my masthead light. It's the fastest, it's the only way out of there. If you can get her to turn around, you come for me. And that's exactly what that man did. He, he got that V-16, Jimmy, and he beat the living hell out of her. And we were lucky. The storm was increasing, the waves were getting larger, but the tide was coming. And every time she'd lift, he'd give it to her. He'd jam her hard, and he brought her. And he brought her around 180 degrees, so she was pointing out. And he took us out of there. He took us out of there. And we got in behind the Portuguese fella, and into New Nantucket we came. Now it's blowing about 40, 45, and it's driving rain, raindrops that long. <laughs> and I'll never forget as long as I live. We were all, of course, huddled in the wheelhouse at the time. Glenn and I were, we really, it, it was like being in a bad movie. I mean, we really didn't, yeah, everything was slowing down. It was a really Fellini-esque, I mean, uh, kind of realized, what the hell are we doing here? We were in college 18 <laughs> months ago, you know? This is the real world now, and uh, wow. And I don't forget, we pulled into the dock, and Bob had the wheel, and Stevie was very sheepish. He had sobered up, and he had quite a bruise <laughs> on the side of his face. But you know, he would never got out of the sitting position that whole time, he sat in that corner like a little boy. And Bob got to the dock and he said, now, Skipper, he said, put your vessel to the wharf. And he walked out and he took his accustomed bow line and we, went, we came ashore. Uh, the Portuguese fellow tied up alongside of us. And of course, we all went over to thank him, 
thank him heartily. And, and it was, uh, I remember the forecastle was beautiful. It was in uh, uh, all dark wood and was kept beautifully. It shined. And, I, and we had coffee and we had cookies. And uh, the Coast Guard came and questioned us at the time. And one of the young Coast Guard fellows led on to Glenn and I, because we were compatriots of the same age. He said, we never could have gotten you fellows. We ran aground coming outside the harbor, and we never could have gotten to you anyway, which was quite revealing. And I remember complimenting the, the cook on his forecastle, and I said, how, how beautiful you keep this living quarters. And he said, well, you know. And I said, yeah, there's no, no reason to live like a pig. And when I said that, he said, oh, don't ever say that word. He said, Capitone catches you, say that word, he'll throw you off the boat. And that was the first time I came to the realization or the knowledge that pig was a terrible word that you never say on a fishing boat. And uh, in later years, perhaps another story, it came to pass. So we went out and we had a few drinks, to say the least. And Bob being older went his way, Glenn and I went our way. And later on that evening, on the Lucky Me, which was a boat out of Gloucester, uh, it was an old Boston beam trawler, and everything in a Boston beam trawler was in the stern, the galley and everything. And it, it was a beautiful old boat with the round portholes, and we were all young fellows at the time in our 20s. And all of a sudden, this big moon face appeared in the, in the uh, porthole, you know, and it was Bob. And he said, boy's got a Budweiser for an old down Easter. You know, and, oh, come in, come in. And we'd been telling the fellows about this guy, this guy whom Glenn and I had nicknamed earlier the Iron Man. And he was the Iron Man. Uh, he did things uh, one time while well, Glenn and I were arguing about uh, going up high aloft and, and tying off a, a vang on a boom, the two of us being the youngest, that was a job for a young man. Bob was already up there doing it. And Glenn and I were, oh, you go, no, you go, I, you know. Uh, <laughs> And so we came in and we had a few drinks and then I remember Bob uh, grabbed me under one arm and he got Glenn under the other. And we were in our cups. And he said, you know, I never had much use for you long-haired bastards, he says, but you two are all right, he said. <laughs> and we had made the grade at that point. And Bob wanted to fly home right away, but the company begged him to stay and bring the boat home. And uh, I know they bribed him with a substantial check and a, and a plane ticket home to, well, Bar Harbor, Maine, uh, Northeast Harbor, actually. And uh, so to end up the story, 1980, uh, 1982, I was just married. I was deckhand on the Tremont, which was the, the high line boat out of, out of the East Coast. And we'd come into the auction early in the morning. There were two phone booths there. There was no cell phones and stuff, of course. And everybody, all the married fellows, and I was just recently married, would get in line and wait to call your wife to tell her that you were home alive and safe. And there's a fellow over in the corner ahead of me, you know, and uh, taciturn looking fella with a Greek captain's cap on. And I'm looking at him and he's looking at me and he sidled up to me and he said, this is Sherman, he says, is that you? I said, yeah, Stevie, that's you, isn't it? He said, yes, it is. He said, and I want you to know that I never touched a drop since that very day. Wow. 